Gary Francione is one of the most prominent theoreticians of animal rights and the vegan movement today. Um, this video is not offering a critique that you have heard before. If you have been reading his work, reading critiques of his work, looking up debates he's already provided to the world via uh, radio, via YouTube, via other platforms, then I can tell you this is not telling you something you have already heard a half dozen times. Part of what makes Francione a um, distinct and memorable voice in the vegan and animal rights world is that many decades ago he broke away from PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and his engagement with the issues has partly been framed as a critique of uh, PETA's methods, its, ideolo its ideology, the limitations of what it does. And I'm sure for many people, especially in Francione's own generation, who discovered veganism as adults, who first had a dalliance with so-called animal welfareist causes, and who gradually progressed from, um, shall we say, softcore to hardcore veganism, I I'm sure his story is a sympathetic one, and the critiques he offers are both useful and um, also have some real emotional resonance, because they'll reflect issues many people will wrestle with themselves. There are people who, you know, at age 30 were still involved with trying to get puppies out of the pound, but were still eating beef, and then made a gradual progression from, you know, to not eating red meat, but still eating cheese, and taking up a bunch of kind of halfway positions, and only very gradually coming to the set of realizations that Gary Francione presents to you, fully packaged, as being, look, either this is a fundamental question of principle, either this is a fundamental question of animal rights, or it is not. And he's inviting you to take that leap to engage with animal rights seriously, become fully vegan, and support the complete abolition of animal exploitation. And abolition is definitely his key word, let me tell you. Now, in this video, I'm going to tell you why I think Gary Francione is wrong, even though I am myself a vegan, and I think I could be described as an abolitionist vegan. Um... In saying that he is wrong, I want to start by clarifying, it does not mean that his work is completely invalid, that it's of no value to anyone, that it should be discarded. Um, political science and economics are really fundamentally different from the pure sciences in that we very often have theories that are valid within limits. We have theories in the social sciences that are valid and useful in reference to some examples and not others, that are useful in some contexts and not others. Uh, you can have a theory in economics that explains inflation in highly industrialized countries, and yet it is not useful at all when you're looking at inflation in a small third world country that does not have industry and that perhaps isn't connected to other markets. Um, that may sound like a shallow distraction to you, but actually it's kind of a profound point. In physics, Either you have a theory of gravity or you don't. I'm not allowed to give you a theory of gravity that only makes sense here on Earth, and then to say, well, you know, um, my calculations, they make sense on Earth, but for some reason they don't make sense on the Moon, so just forget about it. On the Moon, different rules apply. No, you have to work systematically, figure out the principles of gravity in a way that will both explain what we observe here on Earth and what we observe on the Moon in a way that's consistent and reducible to one rule. Well, the social sciences are not like that, or at least specifically political science and economics are definitely not like that. Um, I would note that anarchism is an example of a, a whole set of theories that often work as a critique of a particular issue, of a particular set of issues. But then when you take them outside of their comfort zone and you apply them to other situations and other questions, they become irrelevant, they become incoherent, or they become false if regarded as a set of factual claims. Um, I have never seen a serious anarchist attempt to deal with sewage treatment. How are we going to have sewage treatment without laws? How are we going to manage wastewater being put into a lake that millions of people live around in an industrialized society with um, factories that have hazardous waste, with sewage treatment plants, and with people relying on that same lake for the drinking water? Those are difficult questions, but they're questions governments have to deal with every day. And while an anarchist or libertarian may be sort of working to their own strengths, theoretically, when they're addressing uh, government corruption, government incompetence, police brutality, or a number of other themes, uh, suddenly, when you want to talk about sewage treatment, this whole approach seems to fall apart. 
So this is, in effect, what I have to say about Gary Francione, that he has devised an approach that has some strengths and some weaknesses that is valid in reference to some examples and not others. Francione's approach, the distinctive, crucial aspect, is his claim that we must recognize that all animals have the rights not to be property. So the sort of root, most basic right is, in his words, a negative right. It's not the right to do something. It's not even the right to live. It's the right not to be the property of a human being, and therefore not to be exploited for human use, for human consumption, etc. Um, if we accept this principle, and it is a matter of principle, we must therefore abolish the whole institutional structure of the meat industry. And in general, all of his strengths are in addressing factory farming, and in this critique of what he calls single-issue causes. Uh, now, this approach has some strengths. He is quite strong in pointing out the ways in which there are subtle hypocrisies within animal welfareism. He is quite strong in pointing out the ways in which a campaign from an animal rights group can end up glorifying or encouraging a meat corporation, sorry, a, what do you want me to say here, a slaughterhouse-owning uh, corporation or a food a purveyor of meat like McDonald's by rubber stamping, by endorsing, by approving of uh, one set of animal exploiting practices over another because they cause 10% less suffering or give uh, chickens 10% more space in their cages. To be sure, he has a set of valid and interesting and provocative points here. And I think that even most people who disagree with Francione agree that these are issues really worth thinking about. Now, I would say the weaknesses become evident, though, when we switch the flame, frame of reference to um, habitat conservation and wild animals that I find in general he almost never mentions. So part and parcel of this approach, of Gary Francione's approach, is the refusal to break down and address single-issue causes. And just how bitter he is about that comes out in his online debates. So, for example, he is um, vociferous in his uh, disavowal of the banning of foie gras. He hates this with a passion, the idea that you know, exploiting animals in one particular way should be targeted and addressed in restaurants or in food production. That, you know, production of foie gras is more cruel than just the production of duck meat, pure and simple, and that people should be trying to pass a law to ban foie gras in particular. Um, well, uh, now again, he, he raises some interesting points and questions. You know, why do we care about this one method of feeding and killing ducks as opposed to other methods of feeding and killing ducks, chickens, cows? oysters, turkeys, or monkeys, or anything else. Okay, interesting critique. Um, I used to live in a small, poverty-stricken country in Southeast Asia called Laos. We had a situation there where I believe a species of indigenous dolphin was down to just seven members. I could be misremembering the number, but it was an incredibly small number of this species of dolphin remained alive. Now, if you want to save that species from extinction, you are looking at a single-issue cause of exactly the type that Francione hates. And one of the reasons he hates them is that these single-issue causes do draw you into negotiations with, to compromises with, to discussions with people who profit from animal exploitation. Now, although he has some interesting observations there, I have some interesting observations of my own to counter with. Um... Yes, if you want to save those dolphins, the Mekong River dolphins, the last few families of dolphins, the last few breeding pairs, you are going to have to enter into complex arrangements with fishermen. Yes, evil fishermen, people who kill and eat fish every day for a living. That's exactly who you need to make a compromise with. And you don't have the luxury of just making it illegal to catch fish entirely, which is exactly... Gary Francione's abolitionist approach. We just say, okay, well, ban fishing entirely. It's all bad. It's all killing animals. Well, we got a problem here and now with one particular species, and right now, in whatever, 2016, <laughs> as soon as possible, um, if radical but practicable 
I don't just say practical, but practicable action is not taken, then um, there's no chance for the species to survive. And yeah, that is a single-issue cause, and it's a single-issue cause that will lead you to perhaps not only make compromises with fishermen, and trying to sort out where they can fish and with what methods, trying to ensure enough habitat is reserved for the dolphins and that the dolphins are getting enough of the species they need to eat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these peculiar dotted lines in a map. You know, guess what? You're also probably going to be making compromises with corrupt government officials. You're probably going to be making compromises with exactly the people who themselves have been exploiting these animals and driving, driving them to the edge of extinction. Uh, people whose <laughs> whole economic existence has probably centered on the exploitation of this same stretch of river where you're now trying to save the last few dolphins. Francione definitely opposes ever making animals into legal property. But very often with animals in the wild, and indeed this even happens sometimes with animals in laboratories when you're trying to liberate animals that have been exploited for scientific research, what is necessary is precisely to have someone who gives a voice to the voiceless. Um, a wild animal or an animal that has been discarded by a lab that has no owner has no voice. And again, this is in the year 2016. We're not talking about a science fiction world in the future. We're not talking about an ideal world that vegans created in some parallel universe. If you're down to, say, the last 20 wild elephants living in a troop um, somewhere in some little patch of jungle, they have nobody to advocate for them. They have nobody to represent their interests, say, in conflicts with the government, say, in conflicts with a logging company. Very often, one of the things you try to do is to declare those elephants the property of the state, the property of the king, the property of some millionaire patron, someone like Bill Gates, if someone can intervene and actually claim the animals as their property, then they can very often exercise protections for those animals because there is now a lawyer and there is now a bank account connected to those animals. And I have seen that happen with personhood cases for apes. People were saying, look, you've got an ape that has some background, whether it's a former circus performer or a former victim of um, gruesome experiments in laboratories, say, look, we need to create a legal status for this ape, for this elephant, or what have you, so that it can be legally defended, even if it is being defended simply in its right to sit alone in the forest and uh, forage for food on a daily basis. Okay, I think I've said enough because I'm trying to keep this video somewhat brief and snappy. Um, I do not think that the themes and issues that Gary Francione is raising are meaningless. I think he has created a number of very interesting and worthwhile debates, and I would assume that several decades ago people found what he had to say quite shocking in contrast to what was the accepted norm uh, surrounding animal welfareism, groups like PETA, people for the ethical treatment of animals, and what have you. Um, in the year 2016, it's probably a very positive thing that so many of Francione's views now seem outmoded and old-fashioned. Uh, I think that's a sign of progress. As always, one of the practical issues I raise is the, um, the comparison to cigarette smoking. The solution for tobacco and cigarette smoking has not been to simply declare that nicotine is illegal, that the tobacco plant is illegal, and to make cigarettes disappear. No matter where you are watching this video from, please try to imagine just how short a distance you would have to walk to buy a pack of cigarettes if you wanted to. And if you're watching this video in China, Greece, or Italy, you may be watching in a society where people still smoke to a remarkable extent. But we've entered into a transitional period with cigarette smoking. Even though it is legal, even though it is socially acceptable to some extent, in some contexts, when someone lights up a cigarette, the most common reaction from the people around them is, man, do you really have to? Do you really have to smoke? It is simply perceived right now in 2016 as a bad thing. Parents do not want their children to smoke, even if the parents smoke cigarettes themselves. Think about what a different world we would live in if we lived in a world where parents didn't want their children to eat bacon even if they ate bacon themselves. We're a long way away even from hitting that transitional stage, even from being in a society where meat is perceived as problematic enough for people to say, man, do you really need to eat meat?
but we can get there. And we're not going to get there by taking this impossible science fiction shortcut to living in a world where we can simply declare, oh, nobody can eat any fish. Fish are illegal. Therefore, saving the dolphins isn't a problem. No, no. In the next century, in the next 10 years, we'll have a plurality of genuinely valid single-issue causes attached to veganism. And if you're a vegan, there is no legitimate reason why you can't be a vegan and can't at the same time also be committed to helping a particular population of dolphins in a particular body of water or helping a particular ape in a particular cage, in a particular lab, dealing with single issue causes remains meaningful. And it's going to remain meaningful week to week and month to month because ultimately we're all human beings. We all have only two hands to work with, two eyes, and 24 hours in the day. So yes, you will engage with single issue causes. And particular single issue causes, whether it's a particular ape, a particular cow, etc., they are not all evil in the way that Gary Francione claims they are on the basis of examples because he selects good examples. He selects examples of some single issue causes that you should consider evil because they draw vegans into fundamentally unethical compromises.